Good afternoon. My name is Bonile Baloi, and I am the instructor for the module MMD, which is Matrimonial Methods and Divorces. Uh, on the previous occasion, we had a class, but we could not finish uh, with the, the syllabus due to the time limited, uh, the time limit, and the fact that there were so many questions and so many of you and we could not, you know, get to the end of the of the of the syllabus. So today I'm going to be giving you some pointers and hinges and the application of the law on various important topics which covers matrimonial law and also divorces. I will start because the last time I ended up uh, where we were dealing with settlement and agreement and the right to care and access parental responsibilities towards the minor child. So I found it uh, today I'll be starting to to give you a, a lecture on which is starting on page 54 on the rights of the grandparents and the same sex, sex, sex partners. According to section 23 of the Children's Act, it states that any person, obviously including grandparents and other family members, having an interest in the care well-being and development of a child may apply to the high court uh, or original court or children's court for an order granting the applicant on such conditions as the court may deem necessary contact with the child, care of the child or guardianship of the child. But however, it is also law that for that uh, particular provision to be applicable, there has to be other issues that need to be taken into account and considered by the court whenever such an application is made before the court, which is the best interest of the child, the relationship between the applicants. In this case, it will be either the, the grandparents or same-sex partners and any other relevant person and the child. The degree of commitment that the applicant has shown towards the child the extent to which the applicant had contributed expenses towards expenses in connection with the birth or the maintenance of the child or any other factor that should, in the opinion of the, of, the, of the court, be taken into consideration. This simply means that it's not only um, the parents who have <clears throat> only these rights to care and guardianship and uh, as stated by section 23, however, there are other people who have interest into the child. For instance, if you go into a note, you will see in the case that was decided in LH and another versus LA where the respondent's son was born soon after the husband has passed away or was killed in an accident. After she remarried, her relationship with the in-laws, which is the father of the deceased husband, the parents, of the deceased husband, it went sour and it deteriorated to an extent that they did not have a relationship with their grandchild. They brought in an application, the grandparents in this instance from the paternal side brought an application to re-establish contact with the, their grandson and they approached the court wherein they brought in that application to say that they want to have access and a relationship with the with their grandson. The mother who is the respondent, although uh, opposed that application on the basis that the initial contact with them has, re has, has, has resulted in numerous problems, which convinced her and her husband, which is the current husband, that further contact of that minor child with the applicant will not be in the best interest of the child. Now, the court had to look at both sides and the interest of the child. Remember, the court does not look into the interest of the adults that are involved, but because it's in the interest of the child, the court, the court has to ensure that the child's best interest, the best interest are maintained at all times. In this case, a close relationship with his or her grandparents would have been in the best interest of that particular child for the court to rule in its favor. So, in the present case, the, the respondent attitude was that it was uh, being, uh, for her to oppose the application was motivated, her attitude was motivated 
by personal difficulties or the sour relationship that she had with a uh, former in-laws, rather, rather than to consider what was in the best interest of the child. So in this case, the court ruled in favor of the applicants and uh, structured how the visitation will start in order to re-establish the relationship between the, 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 the child and the grandparent. So it's very important that the child should have a relationship with, you know, their family holistically, be it maternal or paternal, for as long as the best interest of the child are of paramount importance in that particular instance. If it is in the interest of the adult, the court will not consider that because this is not about the adult, but it's about establishing a good relationship and maintaining a good relationship between the child and his friend or her grandparents. And um, also, there's an issue of, um, of same-sex partners, wherein uh, they, they also have the right to a child. For instance, in, in CM and NG, uh, sorry, CM versus NG, the, the issue of parental responsibility and parental rights in respect of same-sex relationship in this instance was considered. The applicant and the respondent in this case were same-sex partner in, a, in a, a couple who began living together in, in 2005. After the year, they moved to London where they lived until June 2020, 2010. Both parties on separate occasions underwent artificial insemination at the Cape Town uh, facility, fertility clinic. As a result of the procedure, a minor child was born to the respondent in 2008. The applicant ha has no biological bond with the child and the respondent, as being the mother, was recorded as parent. So in November 2010, the relationship between the two same-sex partners uh, marriage ended, and then the applicant brought the application in terms of section 23 and 24 of the Children's Act, wherein uh, he was seeking, uh, was seeking an order granting full parental responsibilities and rights in respect of that respondent's child. It was held by the court that both care and contact are components of parental responsibilities and rights in terms of section 18 of the children's act, 18 to, sorry, of the children's act. Having regard to the definition of care, it was clear that the concept of care extends beyond the common law concept of custody. It was accordingly the court's judgment that the interested party applying in terms of section 23 of the children's act for parental responsibility and rights will be entitled will be entitled to an order for both contact and care where this was the best was in the best interest of the child. So as far as guardianship is concerned, the court held that there are two overreaching considerations. The High Court as the upper guardian of all children and the best interest of the child. The court held that section twenty four three only applies where a party seeks exclusive rights to guardianship or sole guardianship where the section provides that in the event of a person applying for guardianship as a child that of a child that has already had a guardian, the applicant must submit reasons why not the existing guardian is not suitable to have guardianship in respect of that particular child. The High Court, with its inherent jurisdiction and as the upper guardian of the of the, of the child of the child of the children to grant an application for guardianship uh, uh, to any person without affecting the rights of the existing guardian was therefore not limited to section 24. Therefore, that means therefore that uh, the court here had to consider the meaning of care in a broader sense uh, with relation to the right to guardianship over the child by the same-sex partners or the mother who was the respondent at the time in which, in which case the, the egg was used. Now, we also have um, limitation against or wherein we have parents of, of a child with different religious uh, beliefs or religious practices, wherein the court will have to stand in to 
to protect the right, the, the best interest of the child in cases where maybe the parents or the separated parents, it's usually the case, have two different uh, 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 religious beliefs or religious practices wherein the court has to look at what is in the best interest of the child if a matter is brought before a court of law to say I am the parent of the child and I am the applicant and I am divorced to this uh, man or woman by consent to custody, uh, uh, I, the child has been baptized as Anglican and therefore uh, the, the respondent say the other party is, is a Catholic and the parties have been married and the child was baptized maybe as a Catholic or as 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 as, as a, or what do you call the other as an Anglican. Therefore, maybe in cases where the parents have separated and the one parent wants the child to uh, practice their own religious uh, uh, denomination or to use their particular uh, religious practices, then in this instance, the applicant sought an interdict uh, to prevent the children from attending a Roman Catholic church while they were spending weekends with the father who was the respondent to prevent the minor children from or to prevent them from receiving any education in Roman Catholic church. In, in that instance, the court held that the parent of a minor child whom custody has been awarded in terms of maybe a divorce decree in this instance is entitled and required to direct the daily life of the child. So educational, religious, secular activities fall within that duty. So in terms of Section 28.1b of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, the non-custodian parent has the duty to provide parental care to the children and to have their right to receive such care. So neither may dictate what religion, if any, their children eventually adopt, but each parent is entitled to provide religious instruction to restrict the, not, to restrict the non-custodian parents' rights and duties in the field of education to secular activities only would significantly erode the parental rights of access. So the application was dismissed, which simply means that according to the court, both parents can guide or instruct the child according to their religious uh, 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 beliefs and practices. However, not to go to a point where a child is confused or it's done in a way that is confusing to a child. It should also be of paramount importance to ensure that the, the, the practices are done in the best interest of the child and not to confuse the child. So you can also look at um, the case of Porter versus Porter in, in that instance wherein the court also ruled uh, that uh, it was held that in, in, in a question, sorry, um, according to this case, the conflict was between the parents of uh, different religious convictions and rights of the child to be free of religious uh, chattels. The court refused to incorporate into a settlement agreement a provision which stated that both parties are not to, to educate the child in the apostolic faith, which means that the court prevented the parents when they were divorcing to say that they are they are shackling or they are locking the child to practice just or be taken to a school only of apostolic faith and that is unshackling the child from a a a, a situation where the child is found to have been it's like it's forcing the child to do certain to to conform to certain beliefs or practices Therefore, the court being the upper guardian in the matter and involving the best interest of the child has an extremely like big power in establishing what is in the best interest of the child. Therefore, it was held that that clause in the settlement agreement in question was not in the best interest of the child as it is not affording the freedom of religion which the child also has in terms of the constitution. So we must be mindful of the fact that in as much as children are children, we would want to guide them, but they are also protected by the constitution to say every person has a right to their religious domination, to, to, to their uh, freedom of expression. So all those rights are also taken in, into consideration, though in the best interest of the minor child.
Now, coming to the rights of the unmarried fathers, uh, this is regulated by Section 21 of the Children's Act, um, wherein an unmarried father has full parental responsibilities and rights in respect of a minor child that is born out of wedlock. Now, you must differentiate the uh, children that are born from parents that have been uh, the rights of children born of parents that have divorced or as they have separated. But in this instance, this is the right of a child that is born of a relationship or born out of wedlock where the parents are not married. It provides that at the time of the child's birth, if he is living with a mother in a permanent life partnership, or he, regardless of whether he has lived or is living with the mother, consents to be identified or successfully applies in terms of Section 26, which is not yet in operation to be identified as a child's father or pay damages in terms of customary law, or contributes or has attempted in good faith to contribute to the child's upbringing for a reasonable period, contributes or has attempted in good faith to contribute towards the expenses in connection with the maintenance of the child for a reasonable period. That person is considered to be a father, in a, an unmarried father, uh, in, in that instance. So if there, in case of a dispute uh, the unmar between the unmarried father and the mother of the child with regards to the fulfillment by the father of conditions as set out in Section 21, the matter must be referred for mediation to the family advocate, social worker, social services professional, or suitable qualified person. In this case, I think also the office uh, the children's court would also be engaged or be a forum where in a matter can be taken wherein there's a dispute over uh, the right of an unmarried father where he's denied the right to have access or to have or play his role in in the life of that minor child. And the the there is case law with regards to that uh, if you have a look into into your notes there is also um, very important cases which they cite, which bring about how Section 21 is applicable. I will take, for instance, the case of uh, the friendship case, so where it states that it is important uh, to note that Section 21 applies only from July 2007, regardless of whether the child was born or after the commencement of the act, which means the act, the section applies retrospectively, even for cases that uh, or of children that were born before its, 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 its inception in July 2007. So in the French case, what happened, the court held that natural father who is not married to the child's mother falls within the meaning of a parent, despite the fact that they are not staying together. So enjoys the right of being a parent to that particular child for the purposes of the school's act and is accordingly liable to pay a school fees. And therefore, Section 22 states that uh, the child, the mother of the child may enter into an agreement providing for acquisition of parental responsibilities and rights in respect of the child with a biological father of the child who does not have parental responsibilities and rights in terms of Section 20, which is uh, rights that are afforded to married fathers or to fathers that are married to the mothers of their children, or Section 21 of unmarried fathers or by the court order. So an unmarried father who, for whatever reason, does not comply with the conditions of Section 21 to acquire full parental responsibilities rights may still have such responsibilities and rights in terms of an agreement that would have been entered into with the mother. So we can speak of something like a parenting plan, wherein the parties have entered into a parenting plan. It gives the rights of the unmarried father, uh, the rights to parental responsibilities and to care for the child and to have access to the child. Therefore, we know of many cases where um, it's usually the fathers that are denied the right to the child or towards the child. Whereas they, you, you know, and you find sometimes mothers would use the issue of maintenance. If you don't pay maintenance, therefore you will not see the child. But rightfully, they do have that right to the child. But obviously, 
they must also show commitment towards the upbringing and the raising of the child by not just contributing financially, but being present as parents in order to uh, assert their rights and show their responsibilities as unmarried fathers. Now we move to the issue of, of paternity. In case where there is a dispute of paternity, we see this mostly in maintenance cases and even in the cases where in an unmarried father is denied the right to have access to the child. There is also provision uh, in as far as blood or DNA tests determine the paternity of the child, of the child, uh, paternity of a child where it is concerned. So section 37 of the Children's Act states that if the paternity of the child has been placed in issue or is in dispute and a party refuses to submit himself or the child's taking of a blood sample in order to carry out a scientific test relate, relating to the paternity of the child, the court must warn such a party of the effect which such refusal may have on the credibility of the party. Because if you are denying that particular right to take place or that particular process to take place, then it means your position as a parent of the child of the child can obviously be questionable as to why are you not refusing. Sometimes people become spiteful because of the personal uh, uh, squabbles that the parents would have uh, against each other and you find that there is denial by one of the parents to do so. Even in maintenance cases, if we go to maintenance court, uh, for instance, you will find that a parent would say, I will not pay maintenance because I'm not sure if this child is my child or not. There is a paternity, there's an office, I think in most of the magistrate courts, where there are maintenance courts, wherein you will be subjected to paternity tests, which will determine whether or not that parent, the, pen, the parent who's a, a, a disputing paternity is concerned, and therefore that would help them uh, in, in resolving their issue when it comes to issues of, of paternity. And then we also have uh, the family advocate when it comes to asserting the rights of the children. The role of the family advocate office, which was established in terms of the mediation in divorce, in certain divorce matters, Act 24, 19, uh, 87, which was came into effect on the 1st of October 1990. So the family advocate is appointed to investigate and to request the parties in cases, for instance, of divorce disputes uh, or on request by the court in the best interest of the child to determine which child, which parent is more suitable to have the daily care which we used to call custody in the olden days, is now called care or, uh, or permanent residence of the minor child. So usually uh, it will be in a form of referral by a form which is called a section, a, an annex B form, which needs to be completed by uh, one of the parties who's disputing or who has an issue with the custody or the right of care and responsibilities and visitation rights towards the child and refer the matter to the family advocate. And uh, the family advocate, as already mentioned, could in a form of a deed of settlement between the parties where children are involved, and can endorse uh, that settlement as a, a agreement before it is made an order, a final order of court, to say that this is the investigation that we have done. And as the family advocate office, we feel that this minor child is more suitable to live with a parent A or parent B based on the, the recommendations that would have been founded by the family advocate upon investigation on the on the on the on the on, the, on both parties. So what happens as a as a mediator, both parents will be called in. If the child is is is, is not too young, uh, it will be looked at who, in which whose parent has the best, it would, would it be in the best in, in the interest of the child to stay with, whether between the mother or the child. So people normally would say the mother would be the best custodian, but it, it happens in so many ways, so many instances wherein the family advocate would find 
it is in the best interest of the child that this, the, the that minor child remains in 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 care of of the of the father instead of the mother, or either way, in care of the father. I mean, of the mother instead of the father and the other party to have a uh, visitation rights. Either those visitation rights will be in cases where there is maybe suspicion of a uh, certain unbecoming behavior by one parent, it will happen that the family advocate can limit the visitation rights of that parent wherein it is in the best interest of the child. But it would have to be something that is very isolated incident which would affect full rights of visitation and contact towards the child. But other than that, the parent will be given full rights uh, and responsibilities and guardianship. Both parents will have guardianship, but the one who has visitation rights, it will be stipulated in the settlement agreement or order of court how those uh, visit, how the, the visitation should be con conducted by or how it should go about when it comes to uh, those parents and that child, but it should be done in a way that it does not affect their daily activity, it does not interfere with school, it does not interfere with their normal routine. So all the time the best interests of the child are considered by the court. And then there's also an issue which normally comes in now, we use it as a clause in settlement agreement, which uh, is, is dealt with under uh, Chapter 7 of the Children's Act of 2005, which, which deals with uh, the abduction of children. For the purposes of this chapter, the Children's Act in, 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 is stated in Section 274 as being to give effect to the Hague Convention and the International um, Child Abduction and to combat parental abduction. This simply means that uh, no parent is allowed, for instance, to move overseas or take a child outside of the country without the, the the consent of the one parent. So in terms of Section 275 of the Hague Convention on International Child Abduction, which is enforced in the Republic of South Africa, and its provisions are law in, in our country, it is important to note that Section 279 of the a legal representative must represent the child in the application in terms of the Hague Convention. It is interesting to know that two, Section 278 of, of that uh, states that the court must, in considering the application in terms of this chapter for the return of the child, afford the child the opportunity to raise an objection of being returned in so doing must give due weight to the objection taking into account the age and the majority of the child, where the child has been taken outside of the country by the one parent. And the one pa the parent who is now agreed can bring an application in terms of this convention to say, I want the return of that minor child. So the court will have to look into a number of issues and also whether the child is raising that objection or not. But also, it is it in the best interest, the court has to deal with whether is it in the best interest of the child in view of the international child abduction matter for that child to be returned or not. So we've seen uh, uh, some cases where in there was one case that I know I can't remember by heart, but the child was adopted by a, 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 a white family and they took the child overseas and the parents now wanted the child to come back and they brought this application in terms of the Hague Convention and that child the matter was heard, but eventually the child retained, returned uh, to overseas with the parents because the court considered that to be in the best interest of the minor child because the child would have been very miserable and it would be very confusing for the child. Therefore, as the upper guardian, the high court as the upper guardian of the minor child, we ruled that it was in the best interest of that child for the child to remain overseas and, and so forth and so forth. Um, immigration and location, this we now deal with it in terms of a settlement agreement where there is a divorce between the parties. So what we normally do, we'd have a clause that states that one, the custodian parent, if he wishes to immigrate, cannot just immigrate 
without the consent of the other parent. So if the one parent needs to immigrate with the other with a child and then need consent from uh, the other parent. So it so happens usually in divorce cases that the custodian parent maybe they've got a job overseas and they have been given a custodian over the minor child, then uh, then should the other person withhold consent for immigration, which is required in terms of section 8.3, C3, home and figure three of the children, the custodian parent may apply to the court for an order which dispenses with the parent's consent of the, the other parent's consent and to authorize the removal of the of the child. So the, the approach followed by the court in this type of application and the circumstances under which such applications are granted were recently considered in various cases. So it, in some decisions, the court held that the in best interest of the child must be weighed against the custodian's right to carry on his or her life and the impact which the immigration would have on the non-custodian parent. So the court looked into a uh, various issues with regards to this. I think you would also note uh, the different uh, approaches by the court on the cases that have been provided in your study material. Virtual visitation, which is something that is now coming into the fore, we, we especially, I would say, even in cases of parents that are not staying together. Maybe the one parent is in another country and the other uh, parent is in another country. So virtual visitation is a support system that the court has implemented to assist parents and, and, and children in continuation of their relationship after separation uh, or relocation by parents. So it, it, it will be another way in which is uh, where a person has relocated, a parent, custodian parent has relocated or immigrated, and then to give rights to the non-custodian parent through Skype, through Google Meet, through Teams, through whichever forums that are now available to make sure that the, the child keeps contact with the non-custodian parent while, you know, away and in absence of that particular parent. But you know, if that is something that it has to be considered, it would have happened after maybe the court had granted the, the, the custodian parent who has migrated or relocated overseas or maybe to another country to ensure that even, not even that, but virtual visitation, even when you don't stay in the same area. Now we've got things like video calling, as long as it's done within the appropriate parameters and within the active parameters, then the parent can make use of that particular form as a form of communication with the minor child who is not staying with the non-custodian parent. Um, so after that, we move to deal with um, the children's court. Uh, I think you will note that in cases of children's disputes, especially where the parents are not married, the children's court comes into play and it plays a very important role in ensuring and protecting the rights of children and their uh, well-being. So you will read from there um, what exactly is the role uh, and the features of, of the children's court and who is the presiding officer. It's usually a magistrate in a court that has jurisdiction over the child, where the child will be ordinarily resident, or one, if one or one child is involved, the area in which the children, if more than one child are involved, so where the children are ordinarily resident, if the jurisdiction is unclear, the court before which the child is brought has jurisdiction in the matter, and the children's court can adjudicate uh, in the matters involving protection and well-being of the of the child or the children, care and contact with the child, paternity of the child, support of the child, adoption of the child. You know, and this is where another forum where in the best interest of the child are upheld 
at all times and to ensure that there is a mediator and someone or a, a the court is to ensure that both parents play their part and also resolve the conflicts that are there relating to the parents from which the child is born, ensuring that the child is not caught between the squabbles or uh, the issues that are affecting the relationship between the parents. So with the children's court, you will often have interim orders which will give an opportunity to the parents to parent in a way that would have been prescribed by that particular children's court to say, okay, we give you six months, uh, daddy, you will see the child every second week, please ensure that you adhere to what we agree or the interim order, and then you go back, the court will have to review if the order is being followed precisely and in the interest of the child, then eventually when the court is satisfied on how the relationship between the parent and the parent, each parent and the child has, has, has been uh, going, then the court will make either a final order will continue with interim orders until the relationship between the parent and the child is stable and between the relationship between the both parents is in such a way that they are now communicating in the best interest of the child. There are cases which uh, they are dealt with in, in the study material where you will notice how the, the, the children's court um, applies or the jurisdiction um, uh, uh, of, the, of the children's court and the cases that have been dealt with under the children's court and how they've been adjudicated upon and how they, they've been uh, concluded and, and what the court is giving as guidance in terms of removing of the child or visitation of the child uh, on issues that have been brought before the children's court. Then um, we will continue and, and deal with the issues of maintenance. Maintenance um, can apply in different ways. So you've got different types of maintenance. Um, so after, uh, what I can say is that you've got, as I said, you've got different types of maintenance. We, we can start by discussing the spousal maintenance. Usually, spousal maintenance, we see it in divorce cases where in the one spouse is claiming for maintenance uh, either uh, during the process of divorce or after divorce. But maintenance should not only be viewed to be maintenance in cases of divorce. Even where spouses are staying together and the one spouse is unemployed and looking after the family and the one spouse who is able to provide financial support is not doing so, the, the spouse who is aggrieved by the conduct of the other spouse can approach the maintenance court to sort a maintenance order and give the reasons why the application for maintenance is brought by parties in a marriage. But uh, also maintenance can be brought during a divorce proceeding in terms of an interlocutory, interlocutory application, which in the high court would be in terms of section, uh, we call it a rule 43 application, wherein a party is bringing an application for maintenance either for themselves and the, if there are minor children for the minor children or for the minor children uh, uh, if the father or the mother is not contributing towards the children in when they are in a process of divorce. So um, in Pillay versus Pillay, the court indicated that in considering maintenance, the court's aim should be to ensure a clean break between the spouses if this is at all possible. So little or no maintenance will be awarded to a wife if one or more of the following factors are present. Now that is in terms of spousal maintenance. She is young or reasonably young. 
She is well qualified. She has no children or no younger children. She has worked throughout the married life and is working at the time when she is applying for maintenance. She is in good health and the court and the marriage was of a short duration. Duration, sorry. So the, if the court needs to look at if the applicant, for instance, is a young, newly married wife who is able to uh, may, to maintain themselves and they're getting a salary, brings an application to court. The court will have to look at those circumstances, whether or not it is justifiable to grant an order for maintenance in such circumstances. So if those circumstances um, apply, then the court will not grant maintenance. So there should be a need for maintenance and there should be affordability for the spouse to pay that maintenance. So the court will rather consider if assets can be transferred in a claim in terms of Section 73 to be put uh, to put the wife in a financial position to satisfy her need for maintenance. So the cases that are stated there are, 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 are indicated that this is the circumstances where the court can be able to afford uh, maintenance or to grant a maintenance order on the grounds that should have been given or advanced by the applicant for maintenance. And there's also rehabilitative maintenance. Rehabilitative maintenance is not a, man it's a maintenance order that is of a limited duration. So it's to put, for instance, the wife in a position that she re-entered when she got herself into uh, into the uh, sorry when she gets herself into a, a a market or a labor market meaning if she finds a job uh, after divorce and then say for instance we say the wife has been granted a rehabilitative maintenance for two years which means after that the, within that that two years the wife should be able to get a job and be in a position to look after themselves and then the the order for maintenance will cease to to apply within the two years. So rehabilitative maintenance is just a maintenance or an alternative maintenance to put the wife in a position to re-enter and settle herself again in the labor market, like giving her an opportunity to be able to look for a job and go back and start working. So rehabilitative maintenance is paid for a fixed period, as I stated, that it would have been maybe for two years or so to say, we're giving rehabilitative maintenance, but it's not maintenance that is infinite as in a normal maintenance order that would have been grounded in terms of spousal, normal spousal maintenance. So this is the principle behind rehabilitative maintenance in, in cases of spouses that are in a divorce. We refer to women because it's mostly women that are disadvantaged in cases of divorces, but that does not mean that a male spouse cannot apply for rehabilitative maintenance. They are within, well within their right to apply for that particular form of maintenance to rehabilitate themselves until they are back in, in the labor market and able to look after themselves. So there is what we call um, nominal maintenance. By nominal maintenance, it means that there is, for instance, uh, if a spouse does not obtain an order for maintenance at the time of the divorce, that the the right is lost to them and does not revise it in the future. So for purposes of nominal maintenance is to keep that right alive, meaning if, um, for instance, the, the, we know that the one partner, let's take the husband, which is an easy way to make an example. We know that the husband is not working right now, but it's very likely or that he will be working in the next coming months or years to come. So instead of just leaving it to say no spouse shall no maintenance shall be paid uh, over a spouse, there is maybe say a one run nominal maintenance that is set by the court, which will be revised uh, when uh, the partner or the husband gets a job to maintain that particular wife. 
So what would happen in a form maybe of a settlement agreement or in a divorce order, the court will set a nominal maintenance of one rent to keep that maintenance order alive. Because if you were to say no maintenance, no order as to maintenance for the party, then the party after divorce cannot go and approach the court and say that, but, you know, uh, I've not been looked after in, in, in this marriage and I've lived my life looking after the children, raised the children, and they are, my husband has stopped me from working. Therefore, I don't have the qualifications. I don't have any experience to be looking for a job. So I will have to rely on their maintenance or salary to maintain me uh, in, for the rest of my life or for in cases of rehabilitative maintenance. Therefore, the court will just have to, in order for that right not to die, put a nominal figure, which is usually a one rent nominal figure, to say once the party uh, from which the maintenance is claimed is able to, to, to support them, a maintenance court can be approached to say, okay, for this amount, uh, this person is earning this much, these are my expenses, then we're revising that nominal maintenance that has been granted by the divorce court original, with original, or high court where the divorce order was made to say we're reviving that maintenance order to ensure that now the party can kick in and the the correct amount will be worked out through obviously affordability and the need from the party that is applying for the maintenance. So that is what is called a nominal and what do you call it a nominal maintenance. Um, now there is doom cast a closer. It is important to keep in mind that when drafting a settlement agreement, it should be stipulated clearly that the maintenance obligation will cease when the other party remarries or lives together as husband and wife with another person. So otherwise the maintenance order will continue for the rest of their lives, even if the parties remarry. So it's very important that when you are drafting a settlement agreement in cases of divorces for the parties to ensure that um, that the 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 the, the, the doom custody closure is included because if you can meet that, then it means that the maintenance will be maintenance for life for that particular party whose maintenance is granted in favor of. So to ensure that it comes to an end at some point, wherein they are able or there is some form of other maintenance that comes into play. Either they find a job or they are they remarry, then it ceases to apply. Then that must be included in a settlement agreement. Otherwise you will have to pay maintenance for a wife of another man. So children's maintenance um, usually done whether in a, for instance, in a divorce, there is a dispute over the amount that is claimed by maybe the the father or the mother towards the other party who is not going to be a custodian parent. So when custody is grant is given, or when a, 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 a custodian parent has been given those rights, the other party should pay maintenance, which should have been worked out to say, okay, if the child expenses amount to 10,000 per month, then we can claim a maintenance or the other party is liable to pay the rest of the 5,000 rand, uh, which contributes towards the 10,000 rand monthly maintenance. If uh, that is not done during a, or if there's a dispute that arises as to how much needs to be paid over the time, the matter is usually referred to the maintenance court. So we we'll state in a settlement agreement that since there is a dispute over maintenance of the child, the matter is referred to the maintenance court. So the maintenance court will be able to work out what exactly are the expenses and the necessary expenses of the child that needs to be covered by the father and to also establish if there is level of uh, uh, affordability from the father because you cannot claim 20,000 rand maintenance uh, from a parent who is only earning 10,000. So there should be reasonableness in, in the process as well to ensure that no party is prejudiced by the, the, the maintenance itself and that 
it is done in the best interest of the child and to ensure that the needs of the child are met at the end of the month. So there is usually a, a form that is completed um, by, by the applicant to state what are the needs of the child and if there's any other children in the household who are not the child of the father where you claim maintenance, then you must state all everything. So you have to be very open about uh, your expenses and what you need them for and the needs of the child. So there has to be a balance between the need of the child and the affordability of the parent uh, in which they, the, the maintenance claim is against. It's a long form. You will, you will see it as, as you go along. It's a very long form that the, the parents need to complete. And the, the beauty of the maintenance court, if there is any doubt or maybe if, if they, there is a, a, a doubt over maybe disclosure of information by the respondent in the application, they are able to do an inquiry into the expenses uh, of, of, of the respondent in, in the maintenance application to see how much they earn. And those who say they don't work, uh, they come and say, but I'm unemployed, then the maintenance officer has the facility to be able to do a thorough investigation into the expenses if there is any check, like they can go to staff and check if the person is employed or not. If you're not employed, you are also given an opportunity to say, hey, go and look for a job and come back. They give you like a form to say, go and look for a job, come back with this form to say that you've been to this place and to this place and to this place, and you still could not get any form of employment. So in that case, there is always transparency in the process uh, as to how they arrive in either giving or granting an order for maintenance or where an order for maintenance cannot be granted. Even in this instance, a nominal maintenance can be given for one rep to say, you will revise this once you get a job. Yes, we understand you are unemployed at the moment, but should you be able to get a job, then you will revise the maintenance, uh, the nominal maintenance to look into how much you'll be earning and whether you'll be able to afford the maintenance and look at the expenses of the child. And there's issues of um, where maintenance has been applied or granted by the maintenance court. You can always go back and review the maintenance order as the child grows and the needs become more, so that you're not stuck with one. Uh, you are not stuck in one place with the same amount for a number of years. So you should always go and re and and revisit and say, okay, the child is now longer in in, in primary. The child is in high school. This is what is needed, this is what is required, these are the needs of the child, and then we re-look at the maintenance and whether or not the other parent can be able or be in a position to afford that maintenance at a time. You will see, uh, just go through all these cases, which will give you an idea on how the courts work when it comes to issues of maintenance. Now we come to um, the termination of the responsibility to maintain. Maintenance can be for a specific period, like I said and indicated, like rehabilitative maintenance, but the maintenance order for a wife will lapse after remarriage or by death of the wife if the order was made in terms of Section 72 of the Divorce Act by the court. So if the order was made in terms of Section 71, in terms of an agreement, the maintenance will not lapse after death or remarriage uh, of the wife unless there is that specific clause which I spoke about of the Dean Castle clause which specifically states that the maintenance will cease upon remarriage or when the wife uh, gets uh, employment. So it's very important that you must look at such details when dealing with issues of settlement. So in cases of a maintenance order that has been given in terms of Section 72 of the, of, of the Divorce Act, uh, the maintenance uh, responsibility or the right to maintain will be terminated. 
And yeah, in, 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 in a, a settlement agreement, it will determine if not specified, then it will continue infinitely. But if specified in terms of Section 7.1, then the, the, the right to maintain will cease to operate at, uh, as and when uh, the specific circumstances are highlighted on the settlement agreement. Uh, in the event of death of the pair of maintenance, the survivor or the ex-spouse will only have a claim against the estate of the pair if it is in terms of an agreement, not in terms of Section 7.2. So if it is in terms of Section 7.1, uh, which is an agreement, then the surviving spouse or the surviving ex-spouse will only have a claim against the estate of the pair if it was stated in an agreement, not in, in terms of Section 73, which is by the order of the court. So it is the legal practitioner must note of the provisions of the maintenance of the surviving spouse, the so-called act of maintenance of surviving spouse, which provides for maintenance of the surviving married spouse and with regard to Section 21 of the of, of that very act, which uh, declares as follows, if a marriage is dissolved by death, after the commencement of this act, the surviving spouse shall have a claim against the estate of the deceased spouse for the provision of his reasonable maintenance needs until his death or remarriage in as so far as he is not able to provide uh, from his own means or any. So that means that where the other spouse has passed away, then the surviving spouse um, can have a claim uh, against the deceased estate uh, for provision of maintenance for their needs until they remarry or until they meet their untimely death. And then there is also claims, uh, maintenance claims by cohabitants, which means is people that are not married but that are, are cohabiting or living together as partners in a life relationship. So with regards to her cohabitants, there is no legal obligation on the party to maintain his, his life partner or wife in, in an intimate cohabiting relationship. So you will note the case of Stain versus Hase, where the court held that the cohabitants generally refer to people who, regardless of their gender, live together without being validly married to each other. So the cohabitants generally did not have the same rights as partners in a marriage or civil union, although no reciprocal duty of support arose by operation of law in case of a married person. There was nothing precluding such duty from being regulated by an agreement. So note, however, that where the cohabitants conclude a cohabiting a contract in which they agree to maintain each other, a legal duty to support is created, which is covered by the Maintenance Act of 1988, which simply means that uh, there's what we call cohabitation agreement. If the parties have entered into that agreement and agree that they are going to maintain or the one party is going to maintain the other party, in case of death of that party, that party can uh, be able to claim maintenance uh, from the from the from, from his, if they 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 separate, then we can make use of that agreement and approach the maintenance court to say that and use of the maintenance act to say that uh, I've been staying with this person, we have the contract, and therefore uh, it regulates the financial matters during our relationship, an equitable division of property upon termination of the relationship a procedure for division of household of goods, payment of maintenance of each other upon termination of, rela of the relationship. So you can use that to say that but we've been staying together and we entered into an agreement which says that this is how we are going to move uh, going forward and we have agreed that in case of the relationship ending, then we've had this in the agreement and we can make use and be binding on the other party. Termination of the responsibility to maintain. Uh, maintenance can be, as I like said, it can be for a specific period or 
Oh, sorry, I've dealt with this. Sorry, I've dealt with this. That is where uh, either the party dies or remarries or enters into another relationship. Then the duty to, ma to maintain comes to an end. So the forum where maintenance matters are dealt with in cases of disputes, the correct forum will be the maintenance court. So any maintenance court within the jurisdiction of the applicant is the maintenance court which will have to hear the application or variation of the maintenance order where the order is being reviewed uh, or in cases of any order where the order is being made for the first time. Now, um, the, the application, this, for instance, I'll give an example of an application in terms of Rule 43, in terms of the High Court Rules and Rule 58, in terms of the Regional Court Rules. So these are the common law. There is a common law obligation of husband to maintain his wife. These are the, there's also a common law obligation for a wife to maintain your husband, if he or she fails to do so during marriage, then the, the agreed party can approach the maintenance court for an appropriate order. This is completely different uh, from a Rule 43 application, which will be used in circumstances where divorce has been instituted and is pending. In the situation where there is no intention to institute a divorce proceeding as stated above, the parties can approach the maintenance court for an appropriate order wherein the one party is not maintaining the other party who is not uh, financially liberated within that particular marriage. However, you well, may well have the effect of causing the other party to institute the divorce, which is sometimes maybe not. Parties are, and the other one is just not is haphazard in using the money and is not being used for the benefit of the household and the other party is not in a position to provide for the household, we can approach the maintenance court to say that my wife or my husband is misusing money and is not using the money towards the, the, the household. Therefore, I'm bringing an application for maintenance to maintain us while we are in marriage. But in cases of divorce, as I've stated in divorce action, in the uh, high Court the Rule 43 can be instituted by the agreed party, and in the in the regional court it's, it's, it's under Rule 58, so it's covered mostly in, in, in it's where in the parties are in a process of divorce. Then the the agreed party brings a separate application during the course of the divorce to say I'm bringing an application before the forum where the divorce is being held for maintenance pending litigation or pending the divorce process and therefore a court would under correct circumstances where the applicant has proven their case grant an order for maintenance during the the, the the process of the divorce. So that is different from a maintenance wherein the agreed party uh, can approach just the maintenance court directly. This is maintenance during a divorce proceeding which has not been completed yet. Now, we have to <clears throat> deal with the variation of existing orders for maintenance. If the parties are already divorced, for instance, and there is an existing maintenance order in terms of maybe a settlement agreement or a deal of settlement that has been entered into during the divorce, or if there's been a previous maintenance court order, either party may approach the court for variation and must complete a particular form. This application to validate a deal of settlement, a copy of the final order of divorce settlement must be attached, which means you approach the court, but it's, it's not uh, common 
for parties to approach a court, like a divorce court forum, for variation of a settlement agreement when it comes to maintenance issues. If the court would, uh, it is it, 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 in very limited circumstances that a divorce court that gave a, a decree of divorce will entertain a variation of a maintenance order, unless if both parties agree to go back to that court to say, we are coming back to this court, we want to vary that clause of maintenance which we had in our settlement agreement. This is how now we want things to work. So that can happen. But usually if there is a dispute in maintenance, the maintenance court will be the appropriate forum to approach in order to deal with a, a dispute over maintenance issues. But there's also variation of a decree of divorce. For instance, that in cases where there is uh, maybe a mistake in the in, in the first order, maybe the name of the party claiming pension fund, the, the name of the pension fund has been incorrectly stated or written or the member's name, pension fund, uh, I'm sorry, the member number has not been put or is required, then they can go back to court to say, you want to vary this uh, order, can you please vary the order? It follows a, 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 an application form. The, 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 the party that is agreed will be an applicant to bring an application for variation before the court. It has to be application for variation has to be served on 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 the respondent in that case and if it's a pension fund to the pension fund and then uh, the court they go back they vary either the pension number or the member number or the name of the pension fund or the provident fund which has been incorrectly written then the court will speak that and then grant an order with the correct details. So non-compliance with any form of an order would obviously give the agreed party recourse either to bring an application for a contempt of a court order, which can carry a, a criminal sentence, or whichever the court would have to grant, you know, the, the, the recourse for the agreed party in those instances, or it can be for instance, in, in, a, in a maintenance matter where there is non-compliance of the order, they, they, they give rise to a criminal complaint in terms of Section 81 of the Maintenance Act of 1988. And there's also, if there is non-compliance, then there is also a civil, uh, um, what do you call it, a civil remedy which will be in a form of a civil execution or a garnishing order where the respondent is garnished, is garnished in, in his salary and there's an order thing uh, attaching the, the salary for that particular amount or that has been ordered by the court to ensure that at every given month that the, 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 the maintenance is paid towards the applicant or the, the party who has applied for maintenance. So, is taken directly from the salary to the average party. And there's also where the in cases of divorces, for instance, maybe, then the 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 the, the, the aggrieved party or the applicant can bring an application for maintenance against a provident benefit or withdrawal retention of withdrawal benefits in a provident fund or or, or, or uh, a pension fund for future maintenance, either for themselves or for the children. So there can be an order to attach parts of a portion of a provident fund or a, a pension fund to say this is for future maintenance for either the applicant or the children of, of that particular party, wherein they are not maintaining their children. You will take a look at uh, all the case law that have been indicated on your study material that will give you an insight into what is meant by withdrawal 
of a benefit in a provident fund for payment of future maintenance. I've already dealt with the issue of contempt of court. It must always be kept in mind that it is now established law that an order must be one of adding what we call before it can be enforced uh, for a contempt of order, where order is, is, is payment of money. It cannot be enforced by a committal of a contempt of order, and the remedy is normally execution. So, if uh, execution of 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 in in a monetary form is the first option, you rather go for that option. Then the 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 criminal remedy only comes, which is the contempt committal of contempt, only comes after that has been tried. So, um, for instance, the in you can look at the case of Valentine versus Valentine, where the Constitutional Court has to decide whether maintenance defaulter may be imprisoned for contempt of court by the High Court. So, look into that, it will give you an insight when uh, the criminal remedy comes in and when the civil remedy comes in, in terms of a contempt of a court order, either of a maintenance court order in this instance. The Maintenance Amendment Act of 2015, Section 26 of the Principal Act, which is the Maintenance Act, is amended to provide that a maintenance officer may, on order of maintenance court, furnish the particulars of a person against whom a maintenance order has been made to any business which has its object, uh, which which has which has as its object the granting of credit or which is involved in a credit rating for the for the for the person. The idea is the maintenance defaulters should not be allowed to get to get credit. By restricting maintenance defaulters from getting credit, they will hopefully realize the agency of looking after their dependents as a priority. Which is a very good thing that you know uh, the amendment act has brought in to say that if a person is defaulting on maintenance and is applying for a car, for instance, or applying for credit somewhere, that it should they, they can go to the maintenance uh, to the maintenance court and sort out uh, information or particulars of that person to say that uh, this person is not paying maintenance and they are going out applying for credit. So therefore. This person is not should not be granted credit on the basis that they are not even able to maintain their own children. Claim against maintenance court officials. Uh, I think this is very straightforward. Straightforward. You can read the case of Mkimunye. It seems that you hardly really need in practice, but if you do, I think it will be uh, informative to read the Mkimunye case. Foreign countries, the enforcement of a maintenance order in another country uh, is dealt with in the Reciprocal Enforcement of Maintenance Orders Act 80 of 1963. And uh, the Reciprocal Enforcement of Maintenance Orders, orders uh, of 1989, which is countries in Africa, it makes provision for a recipro for on reciprocal basis for enforcement of maintenance orders in countries and territories proclaimed for that purpose by the state president. So more or less the same procedure is prescribed in both acts, which requires registration of that maintenance court order in the foreign country before a step can be taken against that person. Parties, estates, and parties that are married in community of property. Now we have done uh, with maintenance. Now we are going to deal with the assets or parties, assets of parties uh, in, in marriage and division and so forth and so forth. So when it comes to parties that are married in community of property, uh, before the abolishment of the marital powers or by the, 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 the result of the abolishing of the marital powers of the husband before the coming into effect of the Matrimonial Property Act. Um, the result is that the provisions of the Matrimonial Property Act regarding equal administration of the joint estate by the husband and the wife 
applies to all marriages in community of property, irrespective of whether they were considered before or after the 1st of November 1984. Remember, before the coming into effect of this matrimonial property act, females or wives in marriages in community of property were regarded as perpetual minors. Therefore, the husband had marital power, which overrode everything. And to say the husband is the major shareholder or is the main holder of assets in 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 a marriage in community of property. So the changes were brought about by the matrimonial property act, which gives both parties the same right with respect to division of the joint estate. So you can have a look at the different cases that have been cited in your study material in order to understand uh, the, the principles that we are talking about in this uh, circumstances and the changes that were brought about by the Matrimonial Property Act against that principle of um, husband being having marital power, sorry. So there is also an issue of uh, transfer of undivided share in joint property. Uh, so it is sometimes happens where parties are married in community of property or have fixed property as joint owners were married out of community of property, where they agree that one of the spouses will transfer his undivided half share in such joint or fixed estate to the other party. So the problem that arises if the parties do not fulfill the agreement by applying Section 45B of the Deed Registry Act, and the property therefore remains registered in both parties' names, should one of the parties later be sequestrated, it may lead to problems. So it's better for the parties to maintain their 50 percent share during the marriage, and only in cases of divorce or death that the half share is is, is divided. Because if you then take your share and you translate to the one spouse's share in terms of the, the uh, section 35B of the deed registry. In case of sequestration, it means both of you will be affected by that form of sequestration. So it guards against the interest of the one party over the other's interest in case one of you is sequestrated uh, in, in, in in marriage is in community or whether it's joint estate, either in, in community of property or out of community of property. So in terms of marriages out of community of property uh, entered into before the first of November nineteen eighty four without any without the actual system. The basic principle is that each spouse has its own separate estate. So if the donation in terms of the con of the ANC or the antenatal contract can be enforced and donations already made remain the property of the receiver. So if in this situation forfeiture may also be requested and the other donations already made must be returned. Alternatively, donations in terms of the antenatal contract which are yet to be executed cannot be enforced anymore. So you can read the different cases and scenarios to understand the principle in cases of marriages without the actual system, what happens in cases of donation in terms of the ANC and how those can be enforced to remain uh, the property of the receiver under the different circumstances. So these cases that are stated here, they give you different scenarios on the different types of marriages entered into a uh, out of community of property without the actual system. Now, in cases of marriages out of community of property with the exclusion of the accrual, in the case there is no claim for transfer, in this case there is no claim for transfer of, of assets. The argument is that there are three choices of matrimonial dispensation if parties willingly decide to marry out of, of, of community of property and without 
uh, the actual system. One of the parties cannot later request the redistribution of assets. So if you've entered into a marriage out of community of property, and then your actual at the end is calculated, you get what you deserve and what you came with and whatever you have accrued in that, that's all that uh, 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 you, you get you get what you came with and whatever has accrued or whatever has happened or you have accrued remains your the separate portion and there is no claim for transfer of the assets in that instance. So each party uh, retain their own property which they came with at the inception of the marriage. Accrual system. If there is no commencement value or the value is zero at the beginning of the marriage, the, com the commencement value is deemed to be new. So all assets except those that are acquired by inheritance, donation, legacy, or personal damages in the name of a spouse, less liabilities are reflected as the accrual in that spouse's estate for divorce purposes. So the party with the larger accrual must transfer half of the difference into the two accruals to the party with the smaller accrual. So, which means what is important to note here is the Section 3A, at the dissolution of the marriage subject to accrual system, the spouse whose estate shows no accrual or smaller accrual than the estate of the other spouse acquires a claim against the other spouse or his estate for an amount of an equal half of the difference between the accrual of the respective estate of the of the of the spouses. I think this is very important to note when it comes to the accrual system that in cases where the party they came with a, a, a commencement value of nil and they accrue whatever they accrue and the one party has a higher accrual from the other or has accrued smaller uh, accrual of the, the of the estate than the other one uh, acquires a claim against the spouse or the estate of an amount equal to half of the difference of the accrual which simply means that you can claim for half of of uh, if you've got a lesser accrual you can claim half that is equal to the half of the parent. It means it's like claiming 25% of the other party's portion uh, to be sort of bring into par with, uh, with the other spouse in to have to what you have accrued during uh, the marriage. And then there is another thing which is called forfeiture in cases of divorce. Forfeiture simply means that where there is a joint estate, the assets must be divided equally unless an order is made in terms of Section 9 of the Divorce Act and is granted for forfeiture of benefits of marriage in community of property. So the courts cannot grant that order just by mere of that order. There is a criteria which the court will have to make use of for such order to be granted. The court will have to look into the duration of the marriage, the circumstances leading to the breakdown of the marriage, the substantial misconduct of one of the parties. The practice has, practice has shown that, that the duration of, of marriage is probably the most important factor. The basic requirement is that if the order is not granted, the one party will, in relation to the other party, be unduly benefited. So the court has to look very deeply and 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 thorough look into thoroughly into the reasons that are advanced for a basis for forfeiture. So what happens in forfeiture of benefits? You find that parties are married in communities of property, but the one party feels that if my my spouse, ex-spouse to be, can get a half share of the joint estate, you will have unduly benefited. Then you must take in your summons that I'm granting, I'm giving the following reason to the court not to divide the estate, but that each party retains what they have in their possession 
and therefore not entitled to my half share, whether it be it of the or the half share of the movables, movables or pension, or based on the following reasons. So the duration of the marriage, if the parties have been married, for instance, for two years, and they have uh, acquired maybe furniture uh, due to the hard work of the other, the other party has been not contributing towards the joint estate, but has been using the money for other things which are not related to the joint estate or the estate of the two parties, and there is extensive misconduct that can be proven in different forms by the party who is asking for forfeiture. You may, you may can raise a, a, a defense for forfeiture against the, the, the other party, and then the court will have to make a determination on the reasons that are advanced, whether or not the, the claim for forfeiture has been made, and the court therefore can grant the claim for forfeiture. You can also look in the different case law um, wherein the court has dealt with how forfeiture of benefits is granted in cases of divorce where the other party will unduly benefit if the marriage, if, if the assets are divided uh, between the two parties by virtue of their marriage in community of property. So you can look into you know, the, the, the MC versus uh, JC cases, the parties are married out of community in this instance. The property with, with the inclusion of the actual system. So after 26 years of marriage, the husband obtained a partial forfeiture order in the regional court based on the wife's adultery, which was deemed to be substantial misconduct. On appeal, the High Court held that the wife would not unduly benefit if she receives the patrimonial benefits of the marriage accordingly that she should not forfeit them. So it depends from circumstances to circumstances and from court to court how they view uh, the submissions that have been made for an order of forfeiture in a marriage, either out of community of property with actual or in marriage with in community of property. So that is the most important uh, step to take into consideration uh, in issues of divorce in as far as practice is concerned. I'm talking about now issues that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, those are the major issues that we come across. So the issue of universal partnership, I think, uh, which is cohabitants, we have dealt with that. Um, but now this is dealing with division. When people live together as husband and wife, or for any given number of years without being married and a relationship comes to an end, it leads to problems, obviously. As domestic partnership bill of 2008 is still in draft form, cohabitants in relationships are presently afforded a minimum legal protection, just like I stated that if you don't have that cohabitation agreement, you actually do not have any legal recourse to claim anything in as much as you have lived for so many years um, because you, you don't have anything to show for it unless you can prove, you know, to the court that the person that you were staying with has been looking after you or has been um, being the sole breadwinner and yeah, but cohabitants are therefore advised to draft the cohabitation agreement as initially stated to cover themselves legally in cases of death or in cases of separation. So you can read the different types of cases which deals with the different forms where in the parties have brought in uh, a claim for maintenance, maybe division, and where there is no contract, and where there is contract that was entered into by the qualities, what happened in those circumstances.
Um, assessment of value of estates. I think you can go through that. Pension interest. Pension interest. This is becoming very one of the most important parts uh, or sections or enforcement of the Divorce Act when it comes to matter of divorces, where there is a claim that has been uh, raised for pension interest in divorce matters. So importantly, what happens is that the parties can either have a claim against the pension interest, each other's pension interest. It's not pension per se, but it is the pension interest. It's called pension interest. If you can go and say that pension fund or right to pension fund, then that is incorrect because we only entitled to the pension, 50% of the pension interest of the other spouses. So in a divorce, you have to accept that and, and, and raise that, the uh, VA is a claim in terms of section 7, 8 of the Divorce Act, and there is a, a, a format in which you have to stipulate that claim for, for pension interest, and it has to be in compliance with the with Section 7 8 of the Divorce Act and also be in compliance with the, um, the, the Pension Fund Act. If that is not done accordingly and is not done in terms of that format, that will be an unenforceable order if you have to take it, for instance, now to the other parties' pension fund or provident fund administrator for a claim to say this cannot be an enforceable order because it has not been properly outlined or properly alleged in terms of section 7 a so you have to follow section 7 a as it is and the way it is stipulated in order for your claim to succeed otherwise you stand a risk of going back and getting to uh, and, and finding yourself in a situation where now, as a party who is aggrieved by that order, you have to go and apply for variation of the divorce decree or divorce court order or settlement agreement in, uh, sorry, settlement agreement in order for it to conform to the rules that are stipulated under Section 7 8 of the Divorce Act. So that is very, very important for any legal practitioner to note that you have to cite it correctly in order for that claim to succeed when it's submitted to the relevant uh, pension fund or provident fund administrator. So you can look at different cases uh, on your notes and that is where the issue is dealt with. So it's very important that you have to be very careful on how you cite that section 7A in terms of, of either in a settlement agreement or when you are pleading to the court or uh, uh, submitting to the court in the form of someone as a claim uh, or in, if you, if it's a counterclaim if it's a defendant side is also claiming for pension interest. So the value of the pension interest is determined by the division of the divorce case. As it's read, you can read the Precature Preservation Pension Fund A case, and then you will find how it is dealt with, and in cases of settlement agreement, how it should be dealt with. And that is very important that a uh, practice must always get that one correct because you stand to go back and spend more money on legal fees because people try to go and do it themselves, but they still get it wrong. So as legal practitioners, we understand this is how it should be formatted in, in a claim for, for pension interest and you avoid, you know, comebacks and, and errors in, in the future. So the retirement annuity, the retirement annuity is not a policy and therefore cannot be treated. A provision such as the defendant feed his retirement annuity to the plaintiff is unenforceable. So since it is in contrary to Section 37A, capital A, of the Pension Fund Act, a retirement annuity fund is found with the express purpose of making it possible for the individual purpose to purchase his own pension. A member of a retirement annuity fund may not deal 
with his retirement annuity fund. For instance, surrender it, negotiates a loan against it, feed it, eliminate it, pledge it in any other manner. A spouse may therefore only share the proceeds of a retirement annuity policy when it accrues to the member, meaning you cannot during a divorce come and claim portion of the retirement annuity, but only when it, you cannot get it while you're in the process, but it, a spouse may only share in the process of a retirement annuity when it accrues to the member. So if it's a 30 year retirement annuity and you are only a divorcing 15 years after marriage and only left with 15 years to, to, to mature or to accrue, then you can only be able to, to get your, 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 your portion upon accrual of, of that retirement annuity. Unlike the pension fund, where in the pension fund interest, where in you can immediately go after the divorce and submit your order of the court to say this is what the court says I can I'm entitled to 50 percent uh, pension interest into the member uh, pension fund or provident fund scheme, and therefore that one you can get it before it accrues. But unlike a retirement annuity, which can only be a, a benefited from on accrual by the member spouse, uh, 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 I mean by the non-member spouse, and when it accrues to the member spouse. I hope you understand me there. So you must differentiate between the pension interest and the retirement annuity. They how they 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 when they accrue and when they can be claimed and how they can be claimed. So that is very important and imperative that we differentiate between the two. So there are precedents as well that are provided for here in your notes, which you can use uh, when you are, uh, uh, maybe may co compiling a deal of settlement, a settlement agreement to say this is how it should look, this is how it should appear in a settlement agreement, and therefore you will not go wrong when it is properly uh, uh, cited in a settlement agreement. Even in your pleadings, it should also be correctly cited, because if it's not correctly cited in your, in your pleadings, it can also give you problems. So you must ensure if you need to make an amendment to your summons or to your uh, plea and counterclaim, and counterclaim in case of a defendant, to ensure that the correct wording is inserted so that you don't you avoid comebacks. What are trust? Uh, we're coming to trust. Uh, a trust is said to be a separate legal entity, but not a legal persona or a juristic person. So a trust is created by a contract called a trust deed, which is entered into by certain parties. So a trust can be described as a legal relationship created by a person, which is a founder, by placing assets under control of another person, which is trustees, during the founder's lifetime, known as intervivos trust, or the founder's death, known as a testamentary trust, which means a trust can be created either by a will or through registration of a, of a trust. So parties to a trust are founders, which is the person who makes the trust, and then the beneficiaries are those that will benefit from the trust in case of death of the founder and the trustees are the holders of the of the trust assets or the trust benefits that I that uh, are held in that particular trust. So you can have upside the trust or you can create your own trust fund and and uh, you can nominate who the trust the beneficiaries are and who's gonna be the trustee is held by so and so and so and so. Therefore, it protects your assets uh, against any form of liquidation, for instance, or you know if there is um, a sequestration. So the founder, as I said, creates the trust and makes the initial funds available to the trust, and is also known as the as the settler or the donor. So the founder should be of majority of age. Any person can be the founder a trustee and beneficiary of the trust on condition that the trustee is correctly trusted. So the trustees are appointed by are appointed in the trustee 
are now charged with the administration of the trust. So it is the trustees are the person as I stated, the, the, the nominated person or people who will uh, be in charge and appointed to be in charge of administering that particular trust. And a beneficiary is a person who uh, is nominated to benefit and uh, from that trust and it includes person, uh, it can be a beneficiary of a trust including persons other than natural pe persons. So beneficiaries are often discretionary beneficiaries to the income and capital of the trust according to accordingly have no right whatsoever to have any claim on the trust benefit. So you just wait for the time until you have to benefit from the trust. You cannot claim or lodge any claim against the trust in which you are beneficiary. So students, you can look into the different case law wherein there has been registration of trust and how it works between the trustee, the trust, the settler, and the beneficiary and how the different courts have dealt with uh, the, the, the claim of trust or the accruing of a trust in, on different circumstances and occasions. Okay, uh, we are now going to deal with We're going to deal with what is a settlement in, in divorce cases. A settlement is an agreement, we call it a settlement agreement, is an agreement entered into by parties in a divorce matter, where in parties um, negotiate and make arrangements on how uh, the assets will be dealt with, if there's minor children, who's going to have rights, of care and who's going to have rights of contact and in, in cases of maintenance where there is no dispute we dealt with we deal with the the dis sorry, maintenance of either the children the amount and escalation in case of defaulting and medical costs and maintenance in, in respect of either the plaintiff or the defendant the amount, if there has to be a nominal amount or if there has to be rehabilitative maintenance or permanent or if not permanent, uh, the doom culture, the laws which says when the maintenance right or the right to maintenance eases and escalation in case of defaulting of maintenance, the division of assets, both movable and immovable, how they are dealt with. Um, in a settlement agreement, how they are dealt with in a settlement agreement in immovable property, what should happen, whether the one party will remain and buy the other one out, whether it's going to be sold and the proceeds shared, movables, how are they going to be shared, pension interest and annuity, uh, if there is a claim, uh, how are they going to to, to be claimed is the annuity, which is like a retirement annuity, and then pension interest, where the party who is entitled, either they can claim against each other or they can waive the right to claim pension benefits, investments, and share other assets, maybe in business as well. How all of that will be dealt with. It's very important, in all honesty, to try and settle the divorce matters before they can go to trial. Because uh, if you go to trial on divorce matters, it's a very tedious and mammoth task, I must say, because at the end of the day, there are certain principles that are applicable. And in order, you know, to, to, to prove your claim against that, you have to really come up with strong evidence and records and documents upon documents. If you are not good, in keeping and, and, and storing information, it becomes a bit difficult to prove otherwise. But usually, uh, disputes arise most cases where there is um, a, key, a, a case of, of forfeiture in, in, in divorce cases. But it's easier if you enter into a settlement agreement 
both parties leave happy and content and they've agreed and it makes the process even smoother. But you must be able to make a settlement agreement that will be enforceable at the end. Always look into the integrity and things like your 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 dream culture clause that must be, you know, there, make sure that you've covered your checks as a practitioner who's drafting the settlement in the interest of the parties. And also make sure that where there's minor children involved and there is issues of custody and care, that the family advocate also needs to endorse that. It's very important. You cannot go to court with a settlement agreement where there's minor children involved and that has not been endorsed by the Office of the Family Advocate. So ensure that it is endorsed and therefore enforceable. That's why we call it, it has to be enforceable. Otherwise, you will not be able to enforce if that settlement is it's not, it's not complied with all the necessary uh, 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 practices or necessary clauses or necessary law or complied with the particular <coughs> applicable law in those instances. So it's very important that your settlement agreement covers all of this that has been stated on page 121. So the cases that deal with this, um, yeah, they are stated there. You can look at different cases on the application and the enforceability of the settlement agreement. <coughs> okay, now um, we're dealing with the summons. These are the summons for divorces in terms of Rule 41, a notice, which is a, it calls upon the notice calling for mandatory mediation, which is also to be served and filed on the defendant, calling them to mediate the issues in dispute to try and limit the issues and achieve common ground. It does happen, sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, once the party has decided that they want to divorce, the most part would have been done, the, the, the mediation would have been gone through and maybe it has failed. That's why when you cite the summonses in the reason, you must state as your last paragraph to say that the parties have tried to mediate, to, to, to mediate uh, or have tried to source out mediation and, 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 and and therefore, there is no prospect for the marriage to be restored by form of mediation or any form of, of uh, bringing the parties together. If you don't have that, that would not be a valid summon. So divorce summons are also prescribed in a particular format. Uh, you must start when you draft them, you must make sure uh, that you, you, before you issue your summons, uh, the parties are probably in terms of section 17.4. The initials, the first names of the plaintiffs are correctly stated if they are working, where they reside, and then the, 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 the defendant as well, their occupation, where they reside, and whether they reside within the jurisdiction of the court, you must state the issue of jurisdiction is very important. You can raise a special plea if the jurisdiction the court in which the, the, issue, the summons are issued does not have jurisdiction. So it's very important to ensure that uh, you, prescribe, you, 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 you conform to the rules that are stated uh, by the 17.4 in terms of setting forth what needs to be in the summons, in a divorce summons. And after that, you must also uh, prove marriage, that the marriage exists when the parties got married, how they got married, and that the marriage is still subsistent. And then from there, you will go on to deal with, it depends on a style. Some people will come and deal with maintenance, with the issue of minor children, that there are minor children born out of the marriage. If there are minor children, how many and what should happen in terms of care and what should happen in terms of contact. And um, after that, if there, is minor, if there isn't minor children, then you don't have to state that they 
You can say that there are no minor children born out of the marriage, or you can just leave it as it is if there are no minor children. Then you will proceed and deal with the, the, whether there are minor children or there is spousal maintenance to be claimed. You can deal with that and show to the court that this is the maintenance you are claiming and the reasons are based on one, two, three. And then from there, you can go on as a matter of time and go and if there's pension interest that uh, are in question, then you can deal with the pension interest to say there is the party who has their either interest in both in each other's pension or provident fund in terms of section 7, 8 of the Divorce Act and you state and stipulated as it has been shown on the examples on, on, on your notes. And from there, you come and deal with the reasons. And then you have to state that the marriage has been severely broken down. So the court will not grant an order for divorce where the marriage has not broken down irretrievably and can never be restored. If there is a possibility or any given chance that the marriage can be restored and you cannot prove that the parties have not lived together as husband and wife for a period of over a year and give valid reasons to the court that, break, that uh, led to the breakdown, the court can say, no, this marriage has not broken down irretrievably, therefore a divorce decree cannot be granted, and therefore we are not granting this divorce. But in most cases, when you go to divorce stage, there is a, 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 there is a very slight chance that a divorce decree will not be granted. As long as you have set out your reasons and true reasons which are compliant with the divorce act, then the court <clears throat> will proceed and grant a decree of divorce. At the end, you must have your prayers. All the information that you have is alleged in your in your someone and, and in your particulars of claim. So you must then come and pray for them. A decree of divorce in this case. A decree of divorce, division of the joint estate, uh, that the non-member party should be claiming 50% interest from the member's uh, pension fund or provident fund, maintenance towards the children, maintenance towards the spouse, division of the joint estate, and, 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 and if it's marriage out of community without the accrual, you must also say that is a marriage out of community without the accrual when you deal with your paragraph four, where you speak of marriage. If this marriage with accrual, you must be able to prove to the court what your commencement value was, what is your end value, and how much uh, each party has accrued and how much they are entitled to. So you have to show all of that in your summer. Otherwise, if you don't do that and you meet it somewhere, then your summons might be considered to be void up in future or they can be considered to be irregular or an exception can be raised on your, on your summons. So to issue summons, it means that after you've drafted your summons, by issuing, it means you take them to the relevant court with jurisdiction. That's where you take it to the lack of the divorce court where they will issue a case number and stamp it as the original and then give it back to you. So you must take three copies with you. The one is going to remain uh, in the court file and then you're going to get the original and the copy which is what you're going to then what So issuing is just taking the original summons that have been signed by the legal representative to the relevant court with jurisdiction for a case number and a stand and to open a file. Then you are given back those summons with the original and a copy. Then from there you take them to personally to the sheriff or you can send by via whichever means is suitable for you to the relevant sheriff under which the, the defendant is residing or working. That will be the sheriff to serve the summons on the defendant. And it must be served in person by the sheriff to the defendant because summons or, or divorce summons are summons that are personal in nature and they change a person's status upon the order being granted. So. It must be served directly on the person or the defendant. It cannot be affixed to a gate or to a door. No, it cannot be served like normal civil summons. They have to be served directly on the defendant. 
So that is that is proper service in terms of divorce someone. So that is very important as well. That you cannot just uh, as a as a sheriff go and put them on a door and come back with a return of service to say that you have served the someone. The return of service must say that they were served personally on the defendant and was positively identified. Then the court will consider those as proper services. Now, there's different forms of service of someone. This is now service of someone where the person's address is known. But it does happen that the address of the person is unknown. So in terms of rule, Five, uh, rule four, three, uh, rule four, um, sub rule three, four, five, seven. Uh, you can also where the the address of the person is unknown and uh, the defendant is unknown, and uh, you can serve the summons via what we call substituted service wherein you don't know the whereabouts of the defendant. So this is service via and where the defendant is untraceable. And you have tried to trace them and use traces and, 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 and then he's still untraceable. So you can uh, serve divorce someone via a newspaper within the area of jurisdiction where you last, or maybe a national newspaper like your star, your citizen, and you have to show that uh, to the court first that you have tried to trace the defendant, but the defendant is untraceable. Therefore, the court will give you a, a interim order which says that the matter, the court will be heard, I mean the divorce will be, the summons will be served via the newspaper, on this newspaper, and so and so and so. You get quotations for different newspapers, but the most important thing is that the best way is to is to publish through a national newspaper where they see the gazette and, and and notices in the newspaper. It's very small columns that you will find. Those are the columns where you would have been given a permission to go and 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 uh, serve the 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 summons, your divorce summons, and you have a summary of your divorce summons. If the 30 days in which it has to lie in the newspaper lapses without any response from the defendant, the court will proceed and then you will set the matter down and that uh, the, the return of service will be your advertisement in the newspaper, you will present your divorce case and to the court and at least you must show that the person has not been with you for at least the period of a year. There you must convince the court that you've done all that you could to find the person, but you don't know their whereabouts. Then a divorce of decree can be granted under those circumstances. Or in cases where the person or the defendant is abroad and uh, you can use Rule 5, which stipulates that no process or document whereby proceedings are instituted shall be served outside the Republic of South Africa without the court. So you must first get a court order that gives you permission to uh, serve via a digital citation. That is now you are going to serve via a newspaper in a foreign country where the defendant is said to be staying. You now you know their whereabouts, but they are not in the country, they are outside the country. So you serve the summons through the newspaper in the area where they are staying. Then once that it has uh, laid for, I think, 30 days, if I'm not mistaken, then after that, you get a response from the newspaper to say uh, there, there was an advertisement for the divorce to take summons uh, from this date to this date, but there is no response. Then you can have that and show to the court that there is no response yet served. And uh, this is the, the 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 case of the plaintiff. The, the someone has been served by a digital citation. Now you must also go and look into. <clears throat> then the order after the order is granted, an ordinary summons is can then be issued in terms of Rule Four, Three, and Four. And then note the requirement of Rule Five that a sworn translation, if 
in an official language of the country where the summons is issued, where the country is not using English, has been made and has been served with a certified copy of the summons, if the language of the summons differs from the language of the country where the service is. So in foreign languages, you must also have an interpreter or an interpreted version of the of the of the notice which would have been said. So it's very important that you follow these rules in terms of issues of uh, digital citation and um, substituted service. So substituted service is where the whereabouts of the of the defendant are unknown that is within the country and a digital citation is where the whereabouts of the defendant are known but is in a foreign country. There's also a digital citation substituted service where either the whereabouts of you know the country that they are from and we've had an era where a lot of South African ladies were for, married to foreign men and uh, they did not, they got their citizenship and then they vanished. They just knew the Pakistanis, Ghanaians, Nigerians, whatever country they were coming from, Asians, then they got their citizenship, they don't know where they come from. So you have to now publish in terms of the newspaper in that country where they come from and get a, a, an interpretation of the language if they're using a different language. So it's very important to know a uh, rule for in terms of service uh, of someone in a divorce case. That is the most important uh, portion of that. And yeah, um, where we now we speak of an unopposed procedure, in particular in divorce action, this is where you have issued summonses and you have said summonses against the defendant via the sheriff or whatever way and there is no notice of intention to defend. Then after 30 days of lapsing of the service and there is nothing from the defendant, you can proceed and apply for a court date and then make sure that you paginate your, your court file and your file and you, you, you include your summons, your return of service. And remember when you issue summons, it's issued with a notice of intention to defend and a notice of intention not to defend. So if that appears and both of them are, are, are there and none of them has been completed, it means it's an unopposed divorce. Therefore, you can go proceed and obtain a divorce on the basis of the family's family. And you must make sure there is a marriage certificate in cases of marriages in community of property, there is a marriage certificate in case of the marriage out of community of property with or without accrual, the antenatal uh, 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 contract is, 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 is attached. In case of customary marriages, you can, if you don't have a marriage certificate, you can attach the Lobola letter to prove your marriage. And if there is a deal of settlement, it has been maybe not opposed, but the parties have entered into a settlement agreement attach the deal of settlement. Then there's also a statistics form that goes to the home affairs and goes to the uh, uh, Department of Statistics, which keeps the steps of divorces every year. So you cannot issue a divorce summons without the steps form. So every divorce summons must have a steps form and must have, in case where there is minor children, there has to be an annex A form, which is compulsory, which gives the circumstances of the children full names, where they go to school, who they stay with, and what happens to them, it must be there. Otherwise, if you don't have all of that information in an unopposed procedure, then you you will have a flawed procedure. So it's very important to keep a proper checklist and the expiry of the DS. So the, the, the summons have been issued and the summons have been served and the period for the defendants to respond has lapsed and therefore there's no intention to defend when you apply for court date and so forth and so forth. And then in cases of a settlement agreement, where there's minor children, has the settlement agreement been endorsed by the family advocate, make sure that it's endorsed by the family advocate and a recommendation, and so the endorsement stamp that says approved is there. If it's not approved, you must revisit your settlement agreement and redo it 
in order for it to comply with the Children's Act. This is, in most in, in instances, that is when it's not complying. <clears throat> then set the matter down. Before you set the matter down, you must pagination and, and, and buy the papers. And yeah, if you're going to brief, you're going to brief. If you're an attorney, you're going to do it for yourself, then you're going to go and present your case before the court. So you, you therefore, uh, at least after that, you attend court with client, and then uh, after that, I think it takes six weeks, you at least a divorce order from the registrar. And also, what is important is the procedure during which, uh, with opposed matters, it will follow the same sequence. You will receive a notice of intention to defend, and then within a number of days, the, the defendant will file a plea and a counterclaim, and then after the counterclaim, the, the plaintiff will have to reply. If then after that, after replication, you will have to do a plea trial to narrow the issue, to see if the, what is in dispute, what is common cause. If there is issues in dispute, then you will have to go before the court and have a plea trial and set a trial date wherein uh, the plaintiff as the dominant litigant, we have to ensure that all the necessary notices and pleadings are pertinent and indexed, and the court date is communicated to the parties, and you've made your discovery and all your pre-trial notices. If you're going to call upon an expert and all your expert notices are there, the discovery affidavit by both parties in, in an opposed matter must be attached to the court documents. Uh, you must discover any form of documentation that you are going to use during trial. Any document that is not discovered cannot be used during trial in a divorce matter or in any um, civil matter. And then if you're going to call witnesses, you must ensure that uh, expert witnesses are also attached and uh, if you're going to subpoena witnesses, they are attached. So that is done pre before the trial, uh, pre-trial uh, uh, stages. So, after all the notices have been served, the discover notices, expert notices have been served and by both parties, then pre-trial consultation takes place and then you decide whether or not you are going to, <clears throat> to, to go on trial or settle the matter. Um, now, we spoke of Rule 43. I think I've spoken about that. This is an application that is brought in terms of the High Court for interim relief during a divorce proceedings, or in terms of Rule 58 in the magistrate court, in the regional court. So we've already dealt, dealt with this. It's done simultaneously with the divorce. Uh, you don't have to wait until the divorce is finished to bring an application in terms of this rule uh, for someone, I'm sorry, for, for maintenance, pending litigation, or for right to care uh, or visitation pending litigation of the divorce. There's also an issue of interdict including orders in terms of the domestic violence and where parties there's been a domestic violence that has been involved that can also be invoked by either parties that have been agreed and uh, can approach the domestic violence court for an application for interdict and as stated in terms of the domestic violence act 116 of 1998 so maybe a, a partner can be can be said to not to come near the one partner or be presented or be ordered to move out of the common estate because of violence or as a result of violence pending the divorce. So that's another application that can be brought by one either party where there is form of domestic violence to prevent, to also to prevent uh, maybe transfer of property, retain proceeds of the sale of assets, prevent uh, the parties from alienation of assets or for the return of the minor children that were un un unlawfully uh, taken away from the one party and the court will have to deal with that. But that is not dealt with by the divorce court 
it will have to be dealt with by the specific domestic violence within the jurisdiction of the parties. And a protection order against harassment as well, uh, that can take off, you can read that, that is something that can be brought by the parties, uh, which are two different uh, 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 provisions, I mean, uh, uh, what do you call them, acts. Uh, the, the protection from harassment act, which came into operation in 2013, it, it's an act that affords victims of harassment from an effective remedy and introduces measures which seek to enable the relevant organs of the state to give effect to the provisions of that act. So it goes on to explain what harassment means. But in case of domestic violence, it's where the people are staying within the same area or the same household. Uh, that's why it's called domestic violence. It's between brother and sister, uh, mother and son, husband and wife, so people that are in a domestic relationship. Uh, <clears throat> the application of the mandament funds fully in divorce matters is used for return of furniture. Where the one party, for instance, these are, 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 are procedures that applications that can be brought during the divorce action that are ancillary to the divorce, but not necessarily part of the divorce. They may arise while the divorce process is going on, and the parties can invoke the, the use of this provision to gain access to property where assets have been removed unlawfully, for instance, and the mandament funds only can be used where the movable of furniture were removed without the permission of from possession of the applicant and uh, note that the ownership is not for a prerequisite, it's just have to have possession of those assets, which is the car that is still owned by the bank and the other party comes and takes away that car without your permission, then you've been disowned or you've been this, uh, 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 what's the word? You, you, it has been removed from you without possession, without you not being the owner, but being the possessor. So you have more rights over that property than the other person who is removing it from you. Then you may invoke the, the use of the application of mandament and spoli to, to get back to, to, for, for the return of those assets in which you have possession over. So post-divorce action, um, where the party, there's a court order and now it's not being enforced. Um, and then what happens, the advice is general, you probably have been advised your client of the implications of the order and the client would want to know what's next after the order has been given. So it has to be enforced. For instance, if there is a pension interest that accrues to your client, we will advise them to take the divorce court order to the relevant uh, pension house or provident fund house to go and claim their share. As long as everything is in order, then in due course they will get their pension uh, interest. And then whether it's movable property, you would have dealt with it, whether it's going to be sold or the one party is going to stay within the property. And um, yeah, stay within the property or going to buy you out or you're going to sell the property and then we'll decide how to do with it. If the one party is supposed to sell the one party out, but it's not doing that. You can always bring an application after that for a liquidation. You can appoint a liquidator who can uh, deal with the immovable property and sell it in order for both parties to benefit from the the, the process of that immovable property. And um, uh, yeah, that is basically it uh, for for maintenance orders. This is a maintenance. Um, a clause within that either you can take that to the maintenance court so that it can be enforced and we have made an order of court in the maintenance court or if the parties are um, civil with each other the, the one party that is uh, ordered to pay maintenance can continue and pay maintenance as long as there is compliance with the maintenance court order and if there is issues regarding that arise post-divorce, maybe revisitation now, 
the one spouse who has care does not allow the other one to come and visit, the, to come and visit the children, or you have the children visit, the one party is at least can apply for variation of that order and it then take the matter back to the family advocate to review what they has been agreed upon because of non uh, uh, compliance with the court order. So that is the most important thing that would have to happen. And uh, whether it's death of the joint estate, parties would have dealt with that. If each party must contribute towards their own debt, that should have been stated either on the summons or counterclaim or on the settlement agreement, how they will deal with the liability. Because you don't just benefit the assets, but you must also deal with the liabilities that come with the marriage. So if they are going to share in them, then the parties will decide when they are going to pay out those debts together if they are both liable and they have agreed on that. Uh, I think that will be it. Uh, the last issue would be issues of adoption, which is the last topic. Um, I think this is dealt with by the Child Care Act and when adoption uh, can happen and what is the procedure. Uh, you know, it's not an easy procedure at all. There is ways in which adoption is dealt with in, in different traditions and religions. So you can go through that and, and see how a Muslim marriages, for instance, deal with with that, and there is cases that have been cited, uh, and how, what happens in cases of divorce where there is an adopted child, or in marriages where there is an adopted child. So marriage is, like they say, marriage is not like an, and everyone complains that you'd be surprised at the large number of that re-enlist. So thank you very much for listening to me. I hope uh, we understood um, everything that I dealt with today, and I wish you all the best. The most of the part that I touched uh, on is issues that are mostly encountered in practice and how they are dealt with in practice. Thank you very much for your time, and have a good evening.